going to introduce herself. So I'm going to ask Shafia if she will introduce herself also. Oh, and I forgot important things. Restrooms around the sides to the back on this wall at the back. And um, we have a raffle. For raffle prizes, we have a packed bundle of um, kitty books and a um, pedometer. And for snacks, we have cold water that's being kept cold. Uh, water, apples, oranges, bananas, cookies, all four buckets. And we have Race Talks t-shirts at $20. So um, please enjoy, and I'm going to run to the restaurant. Miss <laughs> Shafia. So, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. The one God uh, blessings and mercy upon you. My name is Shafia Monroe, and I've been invited by Donna to talk about life as a Muslim woman in Oregon. And she's using ethnicity, so life as an African American Muslim woman in Oregon. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm really glad that we have this opportunity to, uh, to engage and share information. So she gave us a list of questions, and um, I guess a little bit on my background, if I should read it and say that Shafi Monroe is a master of public health, a veteran midwife, a certified childhood educator, a dual trainer, a health activist, and professional speaker. I'm the founder and CEO of the International Center for Traditional Childbearing. It's a nonprofit in mortality prevention, breast milk promotion, and midwife and dual training organization. And I accept Islam at the age of 15 after the unexpected death of my mother. Uh, I consider myself an Orthodox Muslim, and I lean toward the Sufi uh, information, I can say, because that's how I was introduced to religion when I was 15. And in 1981, I helped establish the al Islamic Elementary School from Boston, Massachusetts. And so um, it was a pilot school, and I was the first grade teacher there, so that was a lot of fun. I had kindergarten class, that was really not threatening. I tried to do my Arabic with them, so that was good. And um, also, in 2000, here at Jefferson High School, along with the Oregon, Oregon Islamic Chaplains Organization, we established the first high school program for Muslims called the Jefferson Islamic Student Union. It was right around 9-11 where the Muslim children were afraid to come to school because all of the negativity in the country was going on. And so we were able to um, call, I mean, the principal and other teachers and people in authority to make sure that the young students felt safe. Um, coming to school, and from there we created a consistent, over a year long uh, Friday meeting where Imam Shabazz would come and give the children their spiritual work, which we call the Juma. But also, I'm proud to say that the Islamic group is the first group ever to organize a student led cleanup here at Jackson High School. So that was a really great day with the Saul uh, grant, as well as pulling in other community partners to help clean up. So they paint the garbage cans, they plant the flowers, it was gorgeous. It was nice to see the how the students came back to school and respected the area for almost a good six months. So, um, also I'm excited to say uh, I'm also a midwife, and I have been working on health and equities for over 30 years, particularly focusing on the African American community because the infant mortality rate has been higher uh, historically in this country for African Americans as well as Oregon. So out of um, Seven babies out of a thousand who are not African American will, will, will not live to be born, which is also a tragedy. But if you're African American or Native American, that's close to around 10 just per thousand. That's putting more on the low number. So I work around that as a midwife. And I've been fortunate uh, also to train cultural competency and cultural sensitivity for religious minorities as well as people of color and have been honored as a midwife of 30 years to help numerous Muslim families have home births, uh, particularly in Massachusetts, but also here in Oregon. And um, I'm excited to say that in 2009, with partnership, we led my commission led an initiative that passed. It's called HB 3311. And that was the bill that went through that allowed women on the Oregon Health Plan to have a doula 
Abdullah is a professional who helps women during the labor, which reduces serious sections and infant mortality and just helps moms breastfeed and create what we're looking for. Students who are ready to learn and really succeed academically. So we're excited that bill has passed in about 2015, thanks to our governor, Kiss Hopper, who went to DC and fought for us to have a waiver. That bill has this passing. And it's the first one ever in the nation. So the whole country is looking at us right now to see how it's going to plan out. And then um, I'm a wife, a mother of seven, uh, a grandmother, a nana of eight grandchildren. And my hobbies are gardening, writing, horseback riding, dancing, cooking with family and friends. And um, I received numerous awards, and I've been featured in articles and documentaries. And if you drive down interstate with a new um, uh, McMenamin's Brewery, Beer Brewery, on the wall is a big mural, and there's someone holding a baby with a bunch of children, and that's me. I just caught a baby, and they put that picture on the wall with other um, leaders in the city. So I'm showing myself as a midwife, which I absolutely love and adore. It's like my passion, obviously, 30 years of age in the So. So yeah, I'm excited to be here to talk about uh, my life. And the first question is, so um, my family life was, I was born a Christian. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I say that I experienced early in life a bicultural upbringing because my dad was a Fort Washington Baptist in rural Alabama, married to a third generation Bostonian Catholic. That's like night and day in the family. You know, grits, my dad's side, my mother's doing the fish on Friday, so. It was a very interesting lifestyle um, growing up with two different religions. My dad was very, very religious, very organized with the church all the time. And on his side of the family, we have a lot of deacons, or my grandmother was the church secretary, I think, like the day she died, and she was 101 when she passed away. So literally, she like, never gave that position. So I come from a very strong religious background. I'm leading into that because I believe from my um, accepting Islam, it was easy because I was already growing up in this organization in my own home. However, even at a young age, before I even heard about Islam, I remember being like seven or eight, talking to my dad in the evening about religion. And I was asking, well, why are there three? Why is there a father, a son, and a holy ghost? Like, who am I really praying to? And he would try to explain to me. You know, that he said all kinds of things, but even at a young age, it just didn't gel. And I wanted to know, why did God have a son and not a daughter? I was already a feminist, didn't know it. So I want to know why, why do you have a son? Why, why do you have a daughter? So he couldn't explain those questions to me. So then I'm living my life, and um, unfortunately my mother died in sleep when I was 15. And so, you know, my life was kind of traumatized, of course. And I came home um, from school one day, and there were some men in my home, there were pointers, they were fixing the cement between the brick, and they were dressed in long clothes, and they had the turbans on, and I had never seen people like that before. And I asked them what they were, and they said, we're Muslim. I said, what's the Muslim? They said, we, uh, sorry. That we, uh, you know, we're a group of uh, religious that believe in one God, and that you can talk to God on your own individually. You don't have to use any other mediator. So that really um, resonated with me, because I mentioned being young at seven, I had a problem having to use someone else to talk to God, whether it's a son, daughter, the Holy Spirit, it just didn't, um, it didn't resolve with me. So when I heard that, right away my heart's like, oh, this is for me. Like, but, but that second, I said, I want to become a Muslim, and I became Muslim the very next day. My father's not happy about that, but I did. He tried to be supportive, and then all of my brothers and sisters, I have seven siblings, all seven, all six, all became Muslim after me. So my whole family became Muslim. I have sisters and brothers. My father did not, but he was very respectful of our choice. So, um, and then just in terms of family life, you know, being 15, being on the East Coast, I don't remember seeing a lot of Muslims my age, like 15 or 16 or 17, really. And so I would go to high school and, um, you know, still have my, you know, my covering on, but just got out my friends regularly and did my homework and things were great. And then I moved on to uh, college, and I the school year. I went to the University of Massachusetts to get my undergraduate degree. And again, did not see a lot of Muslims, but a few, but enough that we actually helped organize the first. So all sections, I come family life, my family's an organizer, so I'm always organizing. So my, my uncle was the first African-American to run for mayor in Boston, Massachusetts. My mother was very involved with the Boston public school system, always going to be in the evening, and I was always taught to, you know, to improve things. If you see a problem, fix it. And so again, for Islam, 
you know, being, uh, we say, a bisidrant, a person that has been created in the world to keep order, I already had that in my childhood, so it's very easy to understand my role, my role is to help create peace and harmony and make a better world for all people. So we saw that gap at the University of Massachusetts, and we organized a prayer room for the students there, as well as um, Pajuma. So, uh, so school was fun. I stepped through finishing my master's in public health uh, November 25th on Thanksgiving. That was the day of our test. And for the first time in my life, I, I uh, postponed our family Thanksgiving to a few weeks later. Uh, some other piece that we're going to talk about is who are some of the people who influenced me for my role models, my mentors. So I think there are numerous uh, Muslim um, leaders that we don't hear about. Not only uh, Muhammad Ali or uh, you know Betty Shabazz, his wife, you know the work that she did as a public health person in Chicago. We have senators right now. who are also Muslim this country. We've had Muslim men and women fought you know in this war. We had Muslims who fought in the Civil War, by the way. Because remember when they uh, went to Africa, Africa having 95 percent Islamic population in the continent, uh, it supersedes even I believe I have an expert here. Saudi Arabia in terms of the numbers. So when they captured um, African people, they captured many, many Muslims. In fact, there's several books out where when the Muslims came, they were already literate because they were reading Arabic. You know, they could read and write Arabic. And so a lot of the um, owners, uh, I don't want that word, but the people who uh, maintained these people as enslaved people, uh, let a lot of them move about easily around the plane chain because their ability to you know, negotiate and, and, and translate information. So. We already have Muslims here, and I get excited when I think about that, because again, my dad was a foot-washing Baptist. So if you're a Muslim, we wash three times, five times a day, you know, our face, our hands, our feet, our mouth, our nose, over our head, and our feet. But my grandmother washed, when we pray at night, my grandmother washed her feet every night when she went to bed. And so when I became Muslim, I knew that that, I believe to this day, is a remnant of Islam. Uh, during the enslavement period that, that stayed in the Christianity faith. Because you know, they had to change the religion and hide a lot of things and actually give up their other religion to take on Christianity. And a lot of them tried to um, maintain the religion under under the cloak of Christianity. It's like if you know capoeira, which is an African, African martial art, is isn't a dance. So they danced the capoeira movement was actually a self-defense movement. So the same with the Christianity. So I pretty much knew that my father and my, my grandma really were Pressing Pop Islam in terms of washing things out in the And also, my grandmother prayed at night a lot. Not that Christians don't, but Muslims put a lot in getting up at night and praying. I remember waking up in Alabama in a house and seeing her praying in the middle of the night. In fact, she was always praying, so I said, very religious. We pray five times a day. I think she did at least seven that I could see her physically do it. In between that, you know, constantly reading the Bible and things like that. So, I want to get back to my uh, role models. I would say it would be them. You know, my family have been my role models. I'm very blessed. I had a great mother, had a great father, great grandparents on both sides of my family. Uh, they had very high values of education and, and organization and spirituality. So I really kind of um, look to them for what I have succeeded in today. But then in terms of being a midwife, there's some books you might want to get, and one's called Listen to Me Good. Like the Alabama midwife, uh, Miss Margaret Child Smith, who passed at 100, at 100. She was here uh, in 2003. A midwifery organization brought her in to speak, and she was well known. And so I knew her personally. I appreciated her work of the sacrifice of walking around without a car, without a horse, uh, delivering women's children who could not even be accepted in the hospital, and being able to speak with her. Uh, very religious woman, too. Always use God as her. Uh, light and strength to do the work that she did. So that was always an inspiration to me. And also a recent friend of mine, Ayana Ajay, uh, also a younger midwife, um, was also a role model to me. She really talked about organizing, hanging, and talk, when the things get taught to keep doing it. I think with Islam, it's helpful. We have some sayings uh, to hold on to a people that knows no breaking. So even though things might be difficult, you don't let go. You hold on to God's rope. You know, keep the faith. Um, it's kind of universal. But keep the faith. Hold on to the rope of God. And also, you know that no matter how things, how difficult things get, there's always going to be ease at some point. And we also believe that when things are challenging like that, it's an internal spiritual fight. And as a result, you're getting blessings. And even at some point, maybe some of your sins are forgiven. So, all those role models also kind of taught me that. 
In terms of who helped me decide to be a midwife, I would say definitely God. I had never thought about midwifery. I didn't know what a midwife was. I wanted to be a jet setter and hang out and, you know, be an airline stewardess and heard about babies dying in Roxbury and didn't know what infant mortality was and looked it up and was just totally um, moved that so many babies in this country were not living pre one based on their ethnicity. And I think because um, my family and the religion itself about being a bicyclist, you know, we say that the Creator has 99 names. One of those names is Yasha, the healer, which is my Islamic name that was given to me when I was 15. It just, I was just compelled to do something, and I've been on that path ever since, you know, working to um, organize that babies can come to the world and, and live to be not just one, but to be viable, wonderful, universal citizens. At the same time, I did move up, as I said, my mother did pass when I was 15, and I did move in at 16 for a Muslim family to live with them because my dad, he didn't want me to keep going to Juma on Friday to get them in school. And he said, if I went again, I was going to be in trouble. I was going to get a beating. I was going to speak for myself. So I didn't go. So I didn't go home. I didn't go back home for one year, literally. So I moved with that family. We knew where I was. Asked me, and we were like, Dad, how many of you got me? He said, if I came and got you, you probably would have slept anyway. So he just kind of dealt with it. But I wasn't too far. But, you know, some blocks away, and I would visit. But my story is that the woman that I stayed with was a married woman who had three children. She was pregnant. And I was just like totally excited about her pregnancy, not even knowing why. Bringing her water and wanting to ask all kinds of questions. She was very open about, you know, the baby and, you know, the breastfeeding. So um, she went to the hospital and had the baby, and I was excited when she brought the baby home and learned more about parenting. And she said, You should consider being an obstetrician, which I did not know either what that was at a young age. And she explained that to me. I said, Okay, well, I'll do that. But when I work around pregnancy, but then my uncle said, You should be a midwife. And I looked that up and found there were so many African-American midwives in this country and the great work they had done, and I decided I wanted to go on that track. So that's how I got into becoming um, a midwife. And it asked me to talk to you about any challenges or advantages I've experienced due to being a Muslim. I would say I mostly experienced um, advantages. I feel, you know, I have, I've, I've been blessed as a Muslim. I think most importantly that my family accepted it, my Christian family accepted us. Um, for making that change, to watch all seven of your siblings, you know, resort, resort, resort from being Christian to Muslim. And um, I have to say, too, to be honest, because my mother passed me at 15, and in her sleep is so traumatic that I was making wrong decisions. And maybe, to be honest, I probably wouldn't be if I know the things I would do were not safe things. And because I became Muslim so early and left home and lived in a Muslim family, it actually did save my life. So when I stepped back out at 17, I was prepared to go. I, I quit school, actually. So when I did leave the family and went back to my dad's house, you know, he encouraged me to go back to school. I got my GED at 16, like in six weeks, and then jumped into college. I've been educating myself ever since. I think the advantage after for me, uh, religion, you know, the creator grabbing me, I say, off the streets and putting me in a safe place was um, a good thing for me. You know, the way that I dress, I have never had any problem. People have never approached me and said anything negative. In fact, I was just telling my daughter 15 about you know, the dress. I feel I get more respect. I feel people know, people know who I am. They know what I stand for. That, oh, I'm not, I'm a certain kind of person. They know that most women do certain kind of things. They know what not to ask me to do, but not going to give a yes on that. So it's been, um, it's been good that way. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, and I must say too, I don't really tell people that I'm Muslim. You know, I just, I'm just myself, and I like that more because people always say to me later, I should, you know, you're so different, you're so, no, said, you're so nice, I should have thought that you were Muslim. So I don't really tell people what I am. I try to live my religion. Religion is not the clothes we say, it's the raiment of righteousness that I wear. I try to wear good behavior, respect, you know, kind to people. I speak to every single person. You can be um, a drunk, uh, you know, I speak to everybody, I help everybody, that's how I was raised as my family. And that's what the religion also reiterated for my family, that you help people. You know, so I love that part about religion. And then, um, important life lessons I've learned, I have this little motto I made up myself, it says that um, I'm divinely guided, I'm truly blessed, and I'm living my success right now. But I decided that I don't want to keep looking um, over for success, but to be more grateful what God will give me today, that this moment be successful, that I'm blessed today and I'm being guided to do the work that I do. And major successes, I think, would be, um, I have seven lovely children, a fantastic husband, who's here, by the way, and um, grandchildren, 
So that's my first success, you know, my immediate, but also I'm very proud of the organization I created, the International Center for Traditional Childbearing. If you uh, Google ICTCMidwives.org or Google BlackMidwives.org, they will come up. We're truly international. We travel all over the world, Colombia, uh, parts of West Africa, Puerto Rico, just came back from Trinidad, girls around the world, letting women know that they have options for having a safe delivery, working with policy uh, in this country and other parts of the world that midwives need more um, autonomy because the cost of having a baby, uh, health care in general is compromised. Our, matern our maternal mortality has increased in the United States. That means more women are dying in childbirth in this country, much more than World Health Organization has said to be considered uh, acceptable for the United States of America. And so I am very proud of that work. We've created programs called the Sister Care Program. It's a high school program for girls um, 11 to 15 who want to enter the health field. We mentor them. I've mentored many, many women, again, uh, around the world, so that I feel I'm very proud about that kind of growth that I've been able to do with that. And again, I will call it back to my religion again because it's been hard work running a nonprofit that's grassroots with a minimal budget. When I get uh, frustrated, I actually think of Harriet Tubman who went back and forth over and over and over. You know, she never gave up. She kept going back and forth. So I keep going back to help the women to do the work and um, remembering that if I hold on to the work of God, a lot of it knows no breaking, and after the hardship, they surely eat. So, and then when I see the successful woman who calls me and goes, literally last week, you don't remember me, I'm 25, I used to call you like every year from New York, because I wanted to be a midwife, I kept giving up, you encouraged me, well, I live in South Carolina, and I'm a midwife, and thank you. So I get those a lot from people, and those are very hot warm, and we're going to Good in the Hood, and a young girl from Daily Cell, I mentored her, and now she's 24 with a baby, and she's working to become a young hygienist, so you see all these wonderful people that I forget about because, you know, life gets, gets you busy, and so it's nice if they stop. And so those, those are very good successes for me, and I'm humbled and grateful um, for the work I've been able to do. And I think my last one, uh, my community involvement projects, is, again, health policy, working with the Oregon Health Department in Multnomah County through my nonprofit to look at uh, legislation around access of health care for everyone to help reduce health inequities and health disparities. If you haven't heard of a doula, it's a new profession, D-O-U-L-A. It's a person who is not the midwife. They provide emotional support. So there's a lot of training right now called community health workers. There's a lot of funding going to uh, diversify <coughs> that workforce. So I'm doing trainings for doulas here in Oregon. Our next training is August 22nd, and then again in October, I'm heading to Chicago next week, and then Virginia in um, September, and Atlanta in November, so we travel all over the trainings. And so um, you can find information at the www.ictcmidwives.org. And my words of advice is that is, um, I always tell, I, I want to apply for a volunteer position with the police department a couple weeks ago. And they said, what do you want us to tell the police? And we got quiet. I said, I want you to tell the police that they should smile more. <laughs> and I think that's my word, but I think it's nice to smile, you know, whether it's through our eyes or our teeth. It's, it, you know, we're, we're, we're spiritual energy. We connect through our eyes, through our voice. You know, just simple things. So simple things that we can do to make everyone feel at peace and in harmony. So. My worst advice is to give people eye contact, to smile at people, and to assume that everyone has the best intention. So thank you very much. So again, salam alaikum. Okay, you have to hold it like a rock star. Okay, okay. and that's may peace be upon you. This is the way we use very great people. And uh, of course, I'm not a professional speaker, Doug. Shakira, but I'll try. <laughs> and English also is not my first language, but. So hold on before you start, because I want to say this. Mm -hmm. um, Doa is my hero, uh, my shiro. We had two other speakers who were supposed to speak, and they, they um, had emergencies at the last moment, and so Doa filled in for them. So I think we really need to give Doa a <laughs> So, um, briefly about my life. I was born in the UK where my dad was doing a PhD. My mom was working as a structural engineer. That was back in 78. 
and so I'm 35 years old. And I lived there only for three years, so I don't remember much, but we used to visit every summer until I was 12. Uh, my parents lived there for seven years. They were originally Egyptians, um, and they went to college in Egypt. They lived all their life up to college in Egypt. So when I was three, we moved from the UK to uh, Kuwait in the Gulf area. My dad had a job there, so we lived there for nine years until the Gulf War in 1990. Then I went back to uh, Egypt. So I'm Egyptian and British, so far. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I went to high school and college in Egypt. And I went to the American University in Cairo. And my undergrad study was, I'm a construction engineer or construction engineering and management. And um, I worked for a couple of years, got married, and then I came here in early 2002, which was maybe a critical time that was right after September 11, and many people back home was worried about me, but I was totally fine. I, mean, I didn't feel any problem being here uh, at that time. Um, I lived in West Virginia first. That was uh, from 2002 for about five years, but I visited Oregon twice where my husband had summer jobs with Intel when he was doing his PhD back in West Virginia. And so my husband is also Egyptian and he came in to the States in 1999 for his master's and PhD. Then we moved in 06 to Oregon when he got his job here. So, and I have two kids. One is going fifth grade, a boy and a girl, she's going second grade. Um, so I'm basically a, a construction engineer, but I'm staying at home mom so far. Three years, four years back, I started my uh, online master's in construction law, uh, and I finished that a year ago. Since then, I have been looking for a job, but with no luck so far. So, uh, so that's why uh, I don't think I have like one part of life which is leading, you know, in work life, I don't have this experience yet, so we're having only the perspective from being a stay-at-home mom. Um, overall, my experience is extremely positive, I would say. I would say 99% positive. I didn't feel discrimination other than that, like maybe a couple incidents. Um, one of them, I would say, maybe just, maybe people are not, you know, informative, like I was in the airport once, and at the security, I was told to take off my headscarf, for, and then before I even opened my mouth, the supervisor told the lady that there that, oh, this is for religious reasons. So I don't think she meant anything bad. She just maybe didn't know. Um, in, back in West Virginia, my, I, had, I interacted with government agencies like uh, Medicaid, uh, right from the start, where they sent a nurse to visit me during pregnancy and first first year of my child, and also um, early head start, and all these were professional. I didn't feel any problem dealing with with that. I also took my kid to like um, indoor play groups, and I was always included. And I mean, I didn't feel any problem being uh, an Arab Muslim wearing a headscarf. No problems at all. Uh, I was involved on our community level with Sunday school in the mosque. Uh, I taught little kids, I think, you know, four, four or five years old. So, uh, and I was also one year as the principal and a committee member there in the Islamic Center of Morgantown. Um, when I moved here and my kids started elementary school, I got involved with the PTO. Um, and also my experience is very positive. I was always included. So I did fundraiser project for, my kids went to two schools. So the first school I did fundraiser project, I was included in the PTO with, with no issues. Um, and then we moved and we are now in a school where it's highly diverse. So back to the 2040, in our school, I think white population is 20 to 25% only. So it's highly diverse, but I still, I was still told when I, when we joined the school that, but the PTO is all white and they're like a gang and from some of my friends and 
This year, I was approached by the PTO people to be the VP next year. So, I say this because I have the feeling that sometimes it's the perception of my fellow Arab Muslim women that sometimes they interpret things that it's discrimination while it's not. Like sometimes people don't are not proactive or they don't approve or exclude it. So I guess the attitude makes a difference in, in how you perceive things. So I was always raised proud of my identity and and I and I don't feel inferior and I think that's why many things that happened to me I never um, interpreted as discrimination. I saw my friends wearing the scarf like me. The minute someone talked to them in a not in a nice way, like, like a cashier or a waitress, they would say, oh, it's because we're wearing the headscarf. And I, I never took it this way. I totally forget that I'm wearing a headscarf when I'm outside the house, because I don't wear it inside the house, something that we do. <laughs> so um, I would say, I would say that person, maybe she's grumpy for any reason, maybe she had a bad day, maybe he is not a nice person, maybe he treats everyone this way. I never take it that they're treating me this way because I'm so and so. So, um, my husband told me once that he read in a book of, I think, um, ethical management, that no one can make you inferior without your permission. So, that's why I say sometimes it's the attitude and the perception of people. It's not how you are actually being treated. Um, so, um, so I think part of that is the way I was raised. My dad is, um, I would say he's conservative, but also he's very open to other cultures. And, um, and this balance, I think, is what made me able, able to like, integrate within any society I lived in. And, and still be proud of my identity and have no conflict with, with doing that. And um, so, um, so I'm involved in the, in, on the community level in the PTO and also in my son's Cub Scout committee. So I'm a committee member too in that. So I don't see many of my friends in similar positions. So I'm not sure. If this is, some people would might interpret it as discrimination, but I just, maybe it's just because I'm proactive and I reach for people and I like to make friends from different backgrounds, so that's just people know me. Many of us, I think, just shy off and don't reach out, and that's why just people don't know them, that's all. Um, Maybe one incident that I felt that I'm discriminated against is when my daughter tried to uh, uh, join Girl Scout and we had communication, me and the troop leader over the email and I was going to be her assistant and that's how she was going to accept my daughter. But after we met, suddenly she decided that her house doesn't have enough chairs and that she's not, she doesn't need an assistant anymore. Mm -hmm. So this, this was an incident where I felt that after she met me and knew who I am, she changed her mind. But it's just one incident, so... Um, I would say if I lived here for more than 3,000 days, this maybe, you know, count to really a small percentage of the time I spent here, so... But it's, it's an incident. And, um, and then uh, the other thing, I think, um, <clears throat> about having uh, friends, white friends. I um, also, when you share common interests with people, this is how you start developing relationships. So, because my son in the Cub Scouts, I'm now a friend of a couple of moms whose kids is, are with him in the same den. And um, a couple of years back, I developed a new habit, which is running, and that's how I came with other white friends. We run together, or like you know, go to races together. So that's also another thing is. When people have common interests, I think the ethnicity or the background sometimes disappear. And, um, and I also think when, you, when you're proud of your identity, people accept you more. Like I remember a group of friends, we were, doing, we were going to do something for our kids in Cub Scout and then they, were, they had to, they, they mentioned Marguerite having to do this 
over margaritas and I said, my religious belief is I can drink and I also cannot sit, I mean like be in a, in a place where drinking is taking place. And they were totally respectful and accepting and, and I mean, so again, this, this, is, this comes again back to, um, to be who you are and, uh, and genuine and then people just, I think people are accepting overall. Um, yeah, the other thing is um, about living here, I would say sometimes I feel pressure that I want to tell people that I'm just a regular person like you and I live a normal life and especially when media, uh, sometimes some channels, not all the media, if they, you know, stereotype Muslims or Arabs, sometimes I feel that I'm especially when there's any major incident, you know, like the Boston Marathon. So you we walk in the street and you feel that you want to tell people, this is not our belief, this is not what I, this, I, mean, I totally condemn that. So that's, that's part of living here. Sometimes you feel you're under pressure. But, um, um, but I didn't feel anything from people, you know, like, didn't ask, say anything. And I think people, who know me after a while, they know how, what my beliefs and, um, and that I'm against that. So, uh, I think that's basically my experience here and, um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's it. I told you that Noah was one of my sheroes, but also Shafia is too, because Shafia is an international speaker and agreed to speak here for a pittance. And you didn't know you were getting an honorary. I didn't tell you that. See, they, they just came and didn't even know they were getting one. So um, I truly appreciate it. We have some questions, and I'd like to ask you how you would like to do this. Would you like to ask them questions directly? Would you like to? Uh, discuss in your circles? Um, would you like to just have one large discussion? It's up to you. And I have some, some, um, I have some, some ground rules. So we're going to do this without.